All right. Many of you are ready to hear from our day one keynote speaker, Rahman Chaudhry, who is in New York City right now because she was on Delta. I don't know. I don't know if she was on Delta, but uh, I was getting a lot of texts from her yesterday afternoon saying, hey, listen, I've been at the airport three hours. It's just not looking so good. Um, Ruman got home from the airport, made a video for you, sent it over. I think she's probably very tired, but we have it and we're going to play it because the best she can do in trust and safety is just roll with it. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, so she is very sorry that she can't be here today. Uh, but we understand. Here's the thing. Um, she sent over this beautiful file format. Apparently, we can only play it in a web browser. So we're going to find out. And if it works this time, rad. If it doesn't work this time, everyone goes out a little early. We come back here if you want to, maybe about 1230. We'll have figured it out, OK? Let's see what we get, and then we'll know. <laughs> Welcome to Ramon Chaudhry use trust and safety and now increasingly what's known as AI security which is sort of this hybrid of trust and safety responsible AI and then cyber security I want to talk a little bit about what our different communities have in common and what we can learn from each other given what the past few years have brought us so just a few reflections on the past few years. In short, they've not been great, right? I mean, let's be honest here. For those of us who had worked at tech companies, there have just been massive layoffs. Um, for us at Twitter, it was maybe an extenuating circumstance. He who shall not be named shall not be named. However, we have seen hundreds of thousands of people laid off, and also disproportionately, some will say, from trust and safety teams, security teams, responsible AI teams. Uh, now, it's really hard to say exactly where, how people have been laid off, whether or not it was indeed restructuring, as some companies have said, or whether or not it's part of a bigger effort to consolidate more towards AI development um, than it is through trust and safety, because in, in this effort to maybe what some view as to spur innovation. This meme is not for me. It's actually from Jen Easterly, who runs the uh, United States Cybersecurity Agency, CISA. And what she says here is, we don't have a cybersecurity problem. We have a software quality problem. And this is, in, this is in her latest blog post on LinkedIn, which is actually about the current CrowdStrike um, breakdown of various systems all around the world, the reason why a whole bunch of us aren't able to be there in person today or not able to join at all. And I want to show you a direct quote from her presentation. What she says is that our nation's critical infrastructure, the systems and services that Americans rely on every hour of every day for power, water, transportation, communication, healthcare, education, finance, and much more, is broadly speaking highly digitized, highly interdependent, highly connected, and highly vulnerable. And this is due, in large part, to a fragile software ecosystem that has historically deprioritized security in favor of features and speed to market. Those are really powerful words coming from somebody who was employed by the Department of Homeland Security. Now, this is really interesting because I think that that quote will probably echo with a lot of us in the room. Now, um, cybersecurity is a little bit different, but we see some of the same flavors, right? I have long said, and others have also said, that in responsible use, in trust and safety, in security, in privacy, one of the hardest parts to show people is, quote, value for your investment. In other words, we don't, we're not AI developers who will have a shiny widget or some measurement of um, productivity increasing quarter over quarter. In fact, the kinds of things we prioritize in our work is actually a long game. They may take longer to demonstrate value. And the thing is, the things that we help improve are often quite intangible. Societal benefit for one, trust in a company, an organization, or a product for another, or maybe even just the future viability of your own organization, making sure it doesn't just collapse in on itself. Now, one can more easily measure model accuracy than you can measure any of the above. And yet we know that today we exist in a world in which young people are overwhelmingly feeling depressed and anxious, and social media has an impact on that. We know that more adults are feeling nervous about artificial intelligence and the future of their jobs. We know that fraud 
is increased due to generative AI. And in fact, there's quite a bit of research on how Gen AI, even as young and as nascent as it is, is ushering in a bit of a crisis as it relates to all of our field. The thing is, we're actually replicating the same problems we've had for years, and some of which we thought we had solved. So we know that gender bias is nothing new to AI models, and we see these same trends being replicated in generative AI. You know, we know that um, cultural stereotypes and negative stereotypes that persist on the internet and in biased training data that's resulting from a biased society is also a problem that's been pervasive for many years. Again, it is just replicating in generative AI. On the right is a report that I co-wrote for UNESCO on technology-facilitated gender-based violence with generative AI. So building on their work, important that in the United States we are now in an election that will have a woman of color running for president, Women, are, women politicians, women journalists, and any woman in a position of prominence where being in the public eye is a critical part of the job is overwhelmingly attacked for her gender, her sexuality, her skin tone, nothing to have to do with her actual job, her role, or her perspectives, but literally for existing in that space. So all of this work is not just critically important in general, but it's actually more critically important today. And it does feel a little bit crazy sometimes. Everything old is new again. And I am a millennial and I do speak in memes. I do feel like this sometimes. I remember the chatbot craze of 2017. Remember when everybody said we were all going to get digital twins? Remember the coal miners to coders craze that there was? Remember all of the lists of things that AI was going to do for us? All the radiologists that were supposed to be out of a job by 2022? All of the self-driving cars we were supposed to have on their road? And as a meme I saw recently said, we now have in 2024 radiologists driving their cars to work. So everything old really is new again, right? But what, but what is new is that there are a few things that have changed. One is that generative AI has revolutionized the accessibility of AI systems. The launch of ChatGPT was not just about this innovative new technology. And in fact, it wasn't necessarily a brand new technology for those in tech. We knew what language-based models were. We had been able to generate fairly realistic looking images um, for quite some time. But what changed was that that ability to create content was put into the hands of every human being that would have access to a cell phone or a laptop, some sort of ability to get online. And that truly was what the revolution was. So for a long time, as I mentioned earlier, it was hard for th those of us in responsible AI to show the value of our work, right? In a way that was maybe meaningful to the average person uh, beyond high level percentages or anecdotes. Will generative AI let people explore for themselves and find out for themselves? They don't, they don't have to talk to you or me or anybody else in the room about whether or not generative AI models or AI models in general can promote negative cultural stereotypes. They just have to go ask any language model what a terrorist looks like. So what that builds on is actually this increasing no-code revolution. And I think, again, since we're in a room of practitioners mainly, this is aligned with the culture of good product development. That is actually a really positive thing in this space. We are not talking about ideology. We're not necessarily talking about um, things we cannot define. These are things that are definable, measurable, and also necessary to be built into good product development. So I want to switch over a bit to talk about the silver lining and how to navigate this field of uncertainty. So I've spent probably the last 10 minutes with a little bit of the doom and gloom, and I don't think I've introduced anything to people that they hadn't seen before. But um, here's a few things I want to talk about that I'm seeing as massive opportunities in the space, right? So if our problems are evolving, then that means our solutions can as well. You know, the ecosystem is getting richer. There are more and more people operating in this space that revolution and accessibility now allows for more people to provide input, to give firsthand information, to help inform what they're doing, even if it is not directly in the tech space. Also, I'll add that the regulatory space is getting spicy. It is great to see um, lawmakers from all around the world interested in how to understand the impact of AI systems and seeing it as a necessary 
necessary part of innovation, right? So I think I don't need to tell people in this room, but there is often this dichotomy, this false dichotomy that assumes that you know, innovation is actually against um, any sort of regulation, any sort of trust and safety mechanism, responsible use will just hinder development. And actually that's wildly untrue. So I gave testimony last year um, to the House Science, Space and Technology Committee, and in it I specifically said that responsible use is actually what is spurring innovation. Um, or more specifically, the quote I gave is that brakes help you drive faster. What that means is that the ability to drive fast on the freeway is actually enabled by the fact that we know we can stop our cars if we see something going wrong. So we need to build in that mechanism because absent brakes on a car, even if a car had a capability of going 120 miles an hour, you absolutely would not do that on the road because you would have no way of stopping yourself. And it is the same thing. What would all of us in this room build are safety mechanisms that help people feel comfortable with technology or enable people to build technology on their own terms. So this headline maybe wasn't about all of us, but I do think it is. Tech layoffs are feeding a new startup surge. And this is a trend that we have seen over and over in the various different cycles of tech. So if you've followed tech for the past few decades, like maybe some people have, you've noticed that this is a cycle that happens. There's a burst of innovation, there is this leveling off, and then there are these layoffs as a new technology comes in. It happens with cloud, it happened with the early days of data science, and now it's happening again. This is not to diminish any Everybody's individual personal experience in this, it's just to say that this is often part of a cycle. And, and, and to ask the question, how can we leverage that cycle for our benefit? So I'm going to talk a little bit about this ecosystem that's developing, right? I talked a bit about the regulatory space that's really getting, you know, very, you know, technical in nature, and it's also getting very targeted in nature. I'm excited to see what's happening in the, in the next few years. I think there are folks in the room who directly impacted some of the legislation coming out at the state level, at the federal level, and also some of the regulation happening around the world and through various organizations like the UN, OECD, et cetera. I want to talk a little bit about the work Humane Intelligence is doing and how it relates to the topics that I'm talking about. So we did our very first public bias bounty actually under a different name before generative AI came out. Or actually to re rewind it even further, the first bias bounty was held by my team at Twitter where we opened up our image cropping model to anybody in the world to compete for prizes. And that went over really well. So we started it um, as a nonprofit right before ChatGPT came out. So we held our bias bounty at this AI security conference called Camless and was open to the public as well in October of 2022, where we asked people to contribute innovative code to help create image detection models that would reduce bias based on skin tone, perceived gender, and perceived race. However, everybody at that time asked, well, can you make a no-code version? And our answer was, well, we'll try, but we don't know how. And then came large language models, or specifically ChatGPT. And what that enabled was anybody, as I mentioned, to interact with these models, which means that anybody should be able to help evaluate these models. So what we build are innovative methods of structured public feedback. These include bias bounty, red teaming exercises. And you'll be hearing a lot from us more in the next few months, although our first bias bounty just closed at the end of, at the end of June. And our generative AI red teaming exercise held at DEF CON was the largest ever generative AI red teaming exercise to date with 2,200 people in attendance. We work with civil society, government, and industry, and we're open to working with literally anybody in this room. Uh, again, you'll be hearing a lot more from us to the latter half of this year, and I'm really proud of the team and all the work that they've done to make this. Again, I am unfortunately not able to join, but our chief of, st of staff, Theo Skiadis, is in the room, so if you can find her, please connect with her, or you can find any of us online at humaneintelligence.org. So in conclusion, innovation is not just for AI development, it's for all of us as well. We recognize that generative AI has introduced new challenges, but it also has introduced new opportunities. And in particular, the opportunity that I would like us to think about leveraging is the ability for anybody with any sort of an internet connection to be able to interact with AI models, see for themselves, trust their own eyes and not just what we say. And how can we leverage that accessibility in a way to evolve our own field. 
I'll also add, how can we engage with those who are new to the space, both technical and non-technical, to create more inclusive, diversified, and global approaches? There is a little bit of sometimes animosity between fields. The field of AI safety and AI security is a little bit new to the impact on society space. I hope that there are bridges being built across both fields from their end and from ours to help teach and educate on some of the things that we've been able to build over the last few years. Just for example, if we look at reinforcement learning, right, it actually looks suspiciously a lot like how social media companies have worked on content moderation. And in fact, I'll, I'll end with kind of a, a spicy observation I have made of this field, and you can absolutely quote me on it, I've said this many times, but just about every problem in generative AI can be boiled down to a problem of content moderation. Who gets to see what, when, and how? Now, all of us in this room were, have worked on some aspect of content moderation. In other words, we know the problems and challenges in this field. We know how difficult it is to take a concept that's subjective, like fairness, or whether or not a piece of content is violative, and to do some sort of adjudication mechanism to work on the transparency mechanisms. So that wealth of knowledge, how can that be transferred into the generative AI space? And I'll also add by saying it is a bit paradoxical, but there is actually no better time to be in this field. Uh, uncertainty is the foundation of opportunity. I think for a lot of us, and maybe I am only speaking for myself, but I, I feel like this may resonate with others, um, Getting fired from Twitter wasn't great. It was a pretty tough year that a lot of us had. However, I can confidently say I would not be doing anything that I'm doing today if I was still working at Twitter. Now, I'm sure I, my, I would have had an amazing job there. And I think for, all, for those of us who have mourned the roles that we've had in the companies that we've worked at before, or even the social media space or the AI space as it used to be, we definitely need to make space for how we feel about it. But at the same time, what does this give us? What are the opportunities that may arise, not just from the technology, but from our availability? Look around the room and ask and ask others how many of them have set up their own consulting companies, right? So when I saw when I showed you that headline that there are more startups being being formed, those are not just startups in AI development, but we're seeing a massive ex expansion of startups in AI trust and safety, security, and more. Uh, I know there are plenty in the plenty of people in the room who've set up consultancies, et cetera, working with governments. A lot more people are working, moving over into government jobs. So it has weirdly been a foundation of opportunity for us, even if it was a bit of a rough ride. So with that, I hope that we end with a bit of optimism, and I challenge you all for the next few days to meet people who you don't tend to work with, or somebody who works in a field or who, who works on trust and safety from an angle slightly different from yours, and try to find some common ground. Think about attending conferences in the future that maybe are a little bit different from the community you tend to be in, because now is the time for expansion. Now is the time for inclusivity, diversity, and global approaches. Again, thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, you can reach me at ramon at humane-intelligence.org. And as I mentioned, our chief of staff, Theodora Skiatis, is in attendance, so you can always find her as well. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful conference.